uh, the Mistress of Ceremonies, Brenda Babu, uh, distinguished members of the IPTED 2.0 Consortium, the University of Bern Center for Evaluation, and the Independent Evaluation Group of the World Bank, supporters of the program, the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Other supporters, and most importantly you, the IPTED graduates, good evening. I bring you all the congratulations and good wishes of the IEO, the Independent Evaluation Office of the UNDP, and my own professional network, the United Nations Evaluation Group, where I serve as one of its vice, chair, vice chairs. I also wish to thank the IPTED Secretariat for the important work and the visionary Ray Rist and Linda Mora for starting the IPTED journey way back in 2001, and I was there at the time. The new partnership that you have in IPTED 2.0 has even further gravitas in that the university is concerned, brings substantive evaluation experience and capacity, marks renewal whilst building on the indelible and unmistakable global IPTED brand. As a former IPTED instructor for many years, I have direct experience of how the cause is received and meet alumni across the globe in various forums who talk with pride about being an IPTETA as they now work in ministries and departments building oversight systems backed by an amazing IPTED network. <coughs> you have been privileged to participate in this program and reaching this badge of honor tonight, graduation night. You have been re-inscribed or newly minted as an evaluator in a global coveted program. You have shared your experience in a dynamic program and built collective wisdom and knowledge which in the years to come will remain indelible and practical as you draw on who you met as participants who you now call friends. The new consortium resonates very much with my own thinking and the direction being taken by the IEO in its high profile National Evaluation Capacity Building Series, known as the NEC, a United Nations ship that has and continues to travel across the globe, energizing UNDP geographic regions that span 170 countries and territories, about the values and virtues of evaluation. The UN sees evaluation to improve the quality of people's lives by aligning promise and intent with practice across the full spectrum of its interventions through over 100 UN agencies and related programs. The next ship has also gathered momentum from its maiden voyage in the Arab states in Morocco in 2009, from a modest 50 participants to move every two years to another region and have now sailed full circle and shall return to the Arab states in October 2019 for round two after a decade. The journey has touched participants from almost the full membership of the United Nations, close to 180 countries, reaching thousands, engaging academia, civil society, and the professional networks. Evaluation is critical to the attainment of the SDGs, and the United Nations Evaluation Group has made it a priority to put evaluation on the agenda to build capacity, so that governments can report their progress at the high-level political forums. Some 40 countries have done so to date. And move from a description of monitoring data to an assessment of tangible changes on the ground. The IPTED and our National Evaluation Capacity Conferences are complementary, therefore. And whilst they work separately in structure and form, are, very, are two very significant global initiatives that build evaluation capacity and professionalism. I found that the new IPTED 2.0 curriculum focused on more South, new challenges, and a larger spectrum of target groups resonates with our own thinking on the neck. The IPTED brand lives in thousands of graduates, each of whom is uniquely and collectively a link in the IPTED chain, a chain that girds the globe. In our testing times, it is a much needed professional anchor to keep the craft and principles, to remind the principles that we are mission-driven and that evidence must trump ego and loud voices 
in the performance discourse. And then when there is a challenge, we raise our arguments, not our voices. How better to be able to raise the arguments when you are a professional evaluator with the skills, evidence and experience? This evening I have chosen to talk about the values in evaluation. As I believe that in the context of fluidity, noise, rough winds and seas, it is the anchor that keeps the chain connected and it, if not addressed can lead to us becoming unhinged in the future. As evaluators, we ascribe value. We make a professional judgment on past performance, which is fundamentally necess necessary as part of a diagnosis to improve our future. The Wilson Park Dialogue, which the IEO posted recently, focused on just that, revisiting independence, objectivity, and the criti critically reflective role of evaluation in the SDG era. We make judgments. We need to be comfortable with it, and we will have confidence if we are properly insulated from influence, have the right reporting lines, budget, and power. One cannot be credible and claim to be serving an accountability call if one is reporting to the evaluants. One can if one is reporting to the oversight structures of the evaluants, be it a board, council, or parliaments. The IO has been successful in enjoying structural, budgetary, behavioral, and managerial independence, and its work helped by its own IEO brand, a strong and high demand for its work. It helps that the administrator, Akim Steiner, has affirmed independence and the IEO in, its state, in his statements and uses the evaluation for steering the UNDP. It also helps that the IEO has an evaluation advisory panel in place to advise its work and audit an evaluation advisory committee to engage with, and a board that approves its budget and program of work. The performance question is very political, and with declining resources and active citizenry, more governments are being called to account than ever before to justify their existence. The stakes are also higher around results in this period, as are the politics. We need the credibility to conduct the work and show that indeed we have a fine a, a value proposition and must take as a constant that our work often is about causing good trouble. The billions and trillions wasted across the globe would have helped global humanity had evaluation been more independent, robust, with a more singular focus on ensuring public and corporate sector accountability. More inequalities would have been addressed and through the democratic ethos that evaluation draws on and promotes the values of the UN to which we all subscribe would have been better adhered to. We must recognize that measuring compliance is not necessarily about measuring performance. As we all know that any accountability system can be gained. We have seen it with the various crises across the globe in both the public and, pro and, and corporate sector. This is what distinguishes us from other oversight professions. Even though we may not always have the space and recognition, we deal with power and do not need to be obliged to validate it. We can ask any questions. I thus caution that whilst technical skills are important, there is a very fundamental distinction we must have, and that is to be less of a careerist, to be loyal to the evaluation policy. The first identity must be that of an evaluator, and then a staff member of the organization in which you work. Our job is to build the evaluation bridge for transparent and accountable conversations between the world of the political and its related leadership and the statements of what will or has happened and the reality of the inevitable discrepancies between policy and results. We show up the discrepancies. It is here that the pushback comes whose evidence, whose truth, and in this heated furnace of evaluation communication, we can emerge stronger and better forged if we have good methods, are coherent to in explaining ourselves as a profession. It would be much more useful if we logically follow on that if evaluation is a judgment, it is about accountability and learning can come about in the accountability process. With great power comes great responsibility. Our armor and ammunition is then the principle. 
for which we engage with the principles. I share a few of these reflections. Firstly, the principle of exercising the right to judgment, independence for transformation. I started my professional evaluation life rather naively 23 years ago as the director of South Africa's first monitoring and evaluation directorate, tasked to set up the country's first enemy directorate to ensure land reform was successful. It was an era of Mandela, the first democratic administration, new policies, new dreams, at a time when the euphoria of the country was high and we all thought that good policies and new leaders was ideal to dismantle the apartheid on, uh, order and its censorious structures with the question of land. And all that was needed was sound m and systems to track progress and ensure that land reform happened. We started from scratch, developing systems to get and penetrate opaque administrative systems, more difficult with the land question where hundreds of years of colonialism and apartheid created a geospatial order that no amount of policy or goodwill could dismantle. The value we worked with was evaluation for transformation, to bring about change, to show citizens how progress was being made and to hold to account an administration that was built on racism and prejudice, fear and darkness. I recall the contestation, the sidelining of the function within the department when senior voices were not happy with the messages and when methods were questioned as a way not to improve but to dilute. We are now listening to voices in the evaluation world who say that independence is not important, that units need to support learning. I am not sure when evaluation became a primary teaching function. If so, it should be in the HR units of organizations and not seek to claim to be part of oversight. The definition of evaluation is to make a judgment, to generating a dialogue about performance, to move forward and improve. Secondly, the value of being self-reflective and seeking critique to keep us honest. Independence comes with responsibility, and this means the obligation to seek wise counsel. Who evaluates the evaluators? Obviously, it cannot be the evaluant, if it is set up to be given judgment. However, there needs to be an overarching view of the work of evaluators, and this could be in the form of periodic peer reviews. I would suggest that a more effective mechanism would be to set up an evaluation advisory panel, or like, which I set up in 2013 at the Independent Evaluation Office, and which provided my office with the collective wisdom of the best evaluation and development minds in the world. Their task was to do quality assurance, methodological guidance, strategic directions, and focus on development perspectives. We benefited from our work being critiqued, a better vocab, able to key into global debates and discussions, given that the members owned formidable experience and gained confidence in how we did our work. We just completed a five-year review of the work and found that whilst much progress has been made, more needs to be done, and that doing evaluation at scale and speed was necessary, but it is essential to manage the quality. It is here again that the question of methods comes in, how we conceptualize and craft our evaluations, how we frame the issues, ask the questions, which criteria to use, what is the evaluation process, how we engage and draft results, debrief, give the right to respond, bring in the political and how do to write recommendations. Finally, the final value is that of communication, probably the most important value. We had Sasha speaking to you about that earlier this week. The cost of poor communication is much more than we imagine. The wrong messaging at the wrong time, not recognizing language nuance, being unable to articulate in simple language what we do, is often why many evaluations do not get delivered on time to the right audiences. We all know about eval phobia. It is real that the very words monitoring and evaluation resonate with deep-seated fears in the human brain, evoking memories of school and university days, and causing psychological and physiological tensions. This is our business. We often, whether we like it or not, or can control it or not, evoke negative sentiment, emotions, and inevitable defensive behavior. I have invested time with my IEO team 
engaging in getting us all exposed to brain science. How the other side receives, what the emotions are, and there's much we can learn. I have heard many evaluators take the stance that any feedback is defensive and then pull out the yellow or red card in the context of the World Cup. Labeling the evaluator as being defensive and not listening to the virtues of knowledge, refusing to be enlightened by us, the all-knowing and omnipotent evaluators. We have a difficult balancing act, and I would thus suggest deep reflection by evaluators of their own communication capability. Written, verbal, these are not soft skills and cannot be discounted as unimportant. If we invest in more engaging evaluation process, and obviously still holding to the principles of independence, we can engage more effectively. We must train to see ourselves. And whilst we are often critical of others, my professional experience as a manager in many contexts over many years has shown me that evaluators can learn much on how to listen better, respond with more empathy, and build credibility through greater rapport. In conclusion, I know the value of dinner and drinks and celebrating graduation, and thus will not stand between this fact and you. I congratulate you all again, and wish you well as you continue to do right things. What is right, cause good trouble when you need to. Keep to the principle, and with evaluation, help us create a better world towards the gender 2030. Safe travels, the re-inscribed and newly mentored IPTED 2018. Thank you.